Hi guys, welcome to our other lecture. Today we will be discussing some questions that was asked in this year UPSC CMS exams, and it was shared uh, with me by one of my Instagram student, uh, Dr. Sarthak, and I thank him for sharing the questions. I am sorry that it took so long. So uh, make sure you follow me on Instagram and uh, you download my awesome app so it might be helpful to you. Okay, so the first thing that we need to understand is that the first question that we'll be discussing, see, this is the first part of the video will come in four, five, three, four parts, okay? Because again, uh, I might not be able to complete it in one lecture. And we will be discussing the topics around the questions also so that, you know, we can revise it. So first question that, we will be discussing is that what is the mode of inheritance mode of inheritance of hemophilia b now you need to understand that uh hemophilia hemophilia b is factor nine hemophilia a is factor eight so uh, you have to understand that firstly hemophilia A is far more common than hemophilia B and the mode of inheritance in hemophilia A and B. See, you need to understand that this hemophilia was a royal disease. It was considered to be a royal disease and it affected only the males. Okay, so it is X-linked recessive inheritance. So this was the first question that, uh, you know, we will be understanding the most common the most common joint involved, most common joint involved. Now, this is a very controversial question. Some sources say that it is knee and uh, Nelson says that it is ankle. Okay. Nelson says ankle, but rest all sources, including the Hemophilia Foundation states that the most common joint involved is knee. And why knee? Because when the toddler starts to, you know, uh, uh, walk or, uh, 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 you know, they, they uh, get on their knees and they start to uh, drag, what happens is the knee gets involved first. So that is uh, the important thing. In hemophilia, we initially, we used FFP. Initially, we used FFP, then we used cryo, uh, then we used the factors, okay? The factors were used, uh, the uh, concentrated factors, recombinant factors for, uh, you know, the hemophilia B, we use factor 9. So, uh, the recombinant factors are still used and the government has classified hemophilia in rare disease act and there are multiple hemophilia centers all over the country okay now why is this important is nowadays we are getting a new dr new drugs that we need to understand the first question is what is hemgenics hemgenics is currently the most expensive drug uh, in the market okay it has beaten uh, the zolgensma that was available for spinomuscular atrophy for the most expensive drug and it is approved for hemophilia b it is only approved currently for adults and it is a monoclonal antibody used in hemophilia B. So this might be asked that hemgenics is used for which uh, disease. So this is first thing that hemgenics is used. Then there is, a, a, you know, another drug known as MEC sumab. Okay, this MEC sumab is also a monoclonal antibody. And the benefit of MEC sumab is that it can also be given in once, once a month injections. Okay, once a month injection. See, you need to understand that severe hemophilia happens when the factor levels are less than 1%. Okay, severe hemophilia occurs when the factor levels are less than 1%. So, depending upon the half-life of the recombinant products, uh, you know, you can uh, have different rates. Okay, but amicizumab is used as a preventative therapy. So this is the first uh, drug that was, you know, uh, used as a prevention. See, even factors, recombinant factors can be used as a preventative therapy. But this amicizumab can be used as a preventative therapy just once a month. So uh, to keep the, uh, uh, you know, the blood from, uh, uh, you know, the, the joint bleeding from happening. So this is important, amicizumab. Then there is also some concizumab. Concizumab is also there. To Siran, all these are newer drugs. Uh, just remember that uh, these important things that it is, see, and this is a, a clotting pathway disorder. So it usually presents with hemarthrosis. 
hem arthrosis it is not a platelet pattern so there are no petechial initially there are no petechial either there is hem arthrosis or there are big big uh, bleeds like huge ecchymosis huge hematomas are formed because this is a factor pathway abnormality so the first question that hemophilia b ka inheritance is uh, x link dominant hemophilia c ka is see hemophilia a b ka is x link recessive but for hemophilia c it is autosomal recessive so this you have to remember now next question was that what uh, triad of triad of uh, you know the three things hemolysis hemolysis pancytopenia pancytopenia and venous thrombosis venous thrombosis is seen in okay so the options were g6pd g6pd deficiency hereditary spherocytosis okay then hemolytic uremic syndrome and paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria okay so these were the options now uh, usually in patients of g6pd usually i i am saying commonly you have a triggering factor and in G6PD, what happens is there is acute onset massive hemolysis and there is hemoglobinuria, but usually we do not see venous thrombosis with G6PD, okay? Thrombosis with G6PD is very, very rare. So first, this is out, okay? Now, uh, the next one is hereditary spherocytosis. Now, in hereditary spherocytosis, uh, there will not be, uh, see, it is a, uh, the, the, uh, the RBCs are damaged uh, or the in the hereditary spherocytosis, the RBCs are killed in the spleen. So, usually, you will not have much products of hemolysis. And why would be, there be a pancytopenia in uh, hereditary spherocytosis unless there is a bone marrow failure? HUS again might have a triggering factor. So answer over here is paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So what is PNH? So PNH is a clonal disorder of the PIGA gene. Okay, it is PIGA gene. And this PIGA gene is a GPI, uh, a G protein, uh, anchored protein. And the triad of cytopenia, pancytopenia, intravascular hemolysis and venous thrombosis is actually seen. Uh, it is the known triad of PNH, okay? Now, uh, what happens is there are two issues here. There is CD55 abnormality and there is CD59 abnormality. So, CD55 is also known as DK accelerating factor and CD59 is known as the membrane inhibitor for reactive lysis for reactive lysis. So, these are the two CD that are abnormal and these, these two CDs are actually protective. They are protective now in a pnh this protective and uh, two c the two cds uh, the protective receptors are absent and due to that see what happens is that whenever there is a, a bacterial infection okay or whenever there is a, usually it happens at night because it is in the name it suggests nocturnal so whenever uh, you know the blood flow gets sluggish or there is systemic acidosis now, the systemic acidosis might occur due to CO2 retention while sleeping. This will activate the complement pathway. Okay, this will activate the complement pathway and this will lead to the, uh, you know, the hemolysis and uh, this PNH will manifest with hemoglobinuria. There might be acute renal failure due to myoglobinuria or there might be hemoglobinuria also might cause acute renal failure. There might be a proximal renal tubular acidosis, proximal renal tubular acidosis. And uh, see the absence of CD59, this is very important. This absence of CD59 leads to venous thrombosis. Okay, so the more important factor to cause venous thrombosis is CD59 and not CD55, okay. Also, this abnormal monocytes might not have a plasminogen activating factor. So that is why there are higher chances of thrombosis. Imagine that there is a thrombosis in IVC. So the lower limb, the lower limb entire is, you know, swollen. There might be edema in the lower limb. So all that might occur. Now, uh, you have to understand that usually these patients have a screening test. Like you can give complement-based assay. You can go for hemocytrin. 
uh, you can go for sucrose lysis test. So all this and nowadays we have this aerolysin tests, which are, you know, more recent. So, uh, you know, these are the treatment, uh, sorry, diagnostic uh, markers that you can go for. Now, the treatment can be done with eculizumab. Eculizumab is the same treatment. See, it is it is, it is, is also used for HUS. Eculizumab is actually a C5 receptor inhibitor and, uh, you know, the, the complement activation is prevented by eculizumab. It was once the most expensive drug. And it is also the drug of choice uh, for HUS. If you do not have it, then you have to go for plasma paresis. So these are the treatments for PNH. And this is how you need to go for PNH. Again, the definitive treatment is always and always bone marrow transplant. Okay. The next question was that which is associated with low MCV. Low MCV. Okay. So the options were thalassemia. Second is vitamin B12 deficiency. Third one is folic acid deficiency. And fourth one is sickle cell anemia. Okay, sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia. So again, here the answer is pretty obvious that uh, it is thel. Okay, but this question was comparatively easy. So how do you differentiate between the microcytic anemia of thel? of iron deficiency anemia, okay? Iron deficiency anemia and thal minor, actually. Thal major, obviously, it is too evident to get confused. But in thal minor, there is some degree of overlap. That is why uh, usually uh, it is the one that gets us confused. So RBC count uh, in the iron deficiency anemia is low. Obviously, it is low because the synthesis of RBC is impaired, okay? While in thalassemia, it is high or normal because the, sple the spleen, there is increase in the splenic, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, there is extra medullary hematopoiesis, okay. So due to extra medullary hematopoiesis, the RBC count might be higher, okay. So this is uh, very, very important. Next is that you go for, if you go for MCV, again, in the question it was that MCV is low in both, while red cell distribution width Red cell distribution width is very, very high in the patients of iron deficiency anemia. While in thal, it is mildly high, okay? Not very high. So this is the important thing. Now, next is Menzer index. Menzer index. Now, Menzer index is the ratio of RVC to MCV. And see, again, obviously, if your numerator gets decreased, then the Menzer index will, uh, if the, see, the MCV to RBC ratio, MCV to RBC ratio, okay? So your numerator is low, but the denominator is also low, so index will be more than 13, while in thalassemia, it is less than 13. So this Menzer index is, again, very important. And there is a rule of three, rule of three, which is followed by, uh, the uh, the thalassemia minor, but it is not followed by RBC, uh, iron deficiency anemia RBC. Now, what is rule of three? Rule of three states that uh, hemoglobin into three has to be the value of hematocrit. Okay, and hematocrit into three. Wait a minute, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll one more thing I forgot to tell you that first one is RBC count into three is hemoglobin and hemoglobin into three is hematocrit as I said before. So this is the way it should work and it works that way in thalassemia minor but it does not work that way in thalassemia major. So this is the important differentiation that you need to go for. Again, you go for iron, TIBC values, ferritin, all that and you can easily differentiate it from the other types of microcytic anemia. Okay, so now next question. Uh, what is the next question? Okay, so uh, the next question was about the, see, there were two questions about Duke's criteria. Okay, there were two uh, questions about Duke's criteria. And one question was that what is the vascular phenomenon in Duke's criteria? And second question was what are the major criteria in Duke's uh, criteria? 
Okay, so that uh, is the question that was asked. So firstly, we need to understand modified Duke's criteria is used for infective endocarditis, obviously. And there are two types, major and minor criteria, okay? Now, what are the major criteria? So major criteria is two types, okay? One is the 2D echo is positive. 2D echo is positive. And so the first one is blood culture. Two blood CS should be positive, okay? Two uh, reports which are at least 12 hours apart, okay? Which are 12 hours apart. Two blood CS should be positive. And uh, if you go for one hour, then three should be positive, okay? Except the exception to this is Coxiella Barnetti. Coxiella Barnetti just requires one positive culture. Rest all require uh, two positive culture. In 2D echo, you might, uh, what are the 2D echo findings? Uh, intracardiac masses, intracardiac abscess masses. Which are oscillating with the valve movement. Okay. So these are the major criteria. Two, uh, there are two major criteria. And minor criteria. What are the minor criteria? So minor criteria are temperature more than 38 degrees Celsius. Okay, then uh, predisposing heart disease, predisposing heart disease. Like if you have put an artificial valve or there is formation of non-bacterial thrombotic lesion. Okay, so all that, if it is there, then all those are predisposing. Then vascular phenomenon, immunological phenomenon and blood CS, which is not fulfilled. Blood CS not fulfilled. by blood CS is not fulfilled by the uh, major criteria. Like only one blood culture is positive or you do not, uh, you know, you, you do not wait for it. So that is uh, the important thing. Now, what are the vascular phenomenon? Vascular phenomenon and immunologic phenomenon. So you have to understand that uh, contrary to See, when you have vasculitis, uh, temporal arthritis, imagine that vasculitis. So it is painful. In here, it is opposite. Okay. So vascular has Janeway's lesion. Vascular has Janeway's lesion, which is painless. Painless. Okay. The, the important is the difference between Janeway's and Osler's. Osler's is painful. You can remember this as IO or OI. Okay, then the next one is intracardiac hemorrhage or emboli or splinter hemorrhages or aneurysms, mycotic aneurysms. The most common cause of mycotic aneurysm is not a fungus, it is Staphylococcus aureus. Do not forget this. Uh, mycotic aneurysm, the most common cause is uh, uh, Staphylococcus aureus. It may lead even into the brain abscess. Now, immunologic phenomenon, glomerulonephritis, glomerulonephritis, and rot spot in the eye, in the retina, rot spots, okay? So, these are the vascular and immunologic phenomenon, and you have to understand one thing, that uh, these patients, uh, you can also have HESIC organism, endocarditis HESIC. Hemophilus, Aggregatibacter, Cardiobacter, Iconella, Kingella, Kingi. Okay. So these are the organisms. Hemophilus, Aggregatibacter, Cardiobacter, Iconella, and Kingella. So these are the culture negative, uh, culture negative endocarditis. These are the causes of culture negative endocarditis. So two questions solved over here. There was one question on spontaneous bacterial peri peritonitis. Very important. See, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis occurs due to the rupture of uh, the gut. And the most common organism thus turns out to be E. coli. Okay. So, most common organism for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is E. coli. Uh, nephrotic syndrome is an exception. You can see most commonly with pneumococcus or staphylococcus. Uh, so, depending upon the condition, it might change, but generally it is E. coli or it is actually multibacterial, okay? Not unibacterial, it is multibacterial, okay? So, this was the thing. 
Okay. Now, uh, the one question was asked that what was the serologic marker? Serologic marker of hepatitis in window period. So first thing that the first marker uh, of hepatitis B to rise in any uh, hepatitis B infection, the first marker to rise is first marker is increase ALT, but it is absolutely non-specific. So we cannot go for uh, uh, that reliability. Okay. So increase ALT is a first marker and it is a very non-specific marker. Then HBS AG rises. Okay. Then there is a window period when uh, there are there is develop after which there is development of IgM anti-HVS AG anti-HVS AG. Okay, so this is the important thing uh, that you know the after a period the uh, IgM anti-HS uh, HVS AG develops and during that period uh, the time it takes between those that HVS AG is disappeared has already disappeared. And IgM is rising. So at that point, it is a window period and it can only be diagnosed with NTHBC IgM. Okay. So this was the question that which marker is used for window period. So this is important. Another one, two line, I'll tell you that what is the quantitative marker, quantitative marker. So it is HBV DNA. And what is the qualitative marker of replication? Qualitative marker of replication of hepatitis B. So it is HBEAG. Okay. So these are the, uh, the two questions that are uh, commonly asked. When you have a newborn of HBS AG positivity, then you have to give IG uh, uh, immunoglobulin, IVIG, uh, HBS IG, or uh, uh, you know, hepatitis B immunoglobulin. And the vaccine at birth and then you have to follow up the patient at six months and you have to check for the viral marker copies and HBS AG. Okay. And if you are vaccinated, your only anti-HBS AG will be elevated. So that is uh, very, very important. And again, there was a question of pre-core mutant that it is uh, uh, it is a, a virulent form and it has it is HBE AG negative yet it replicates like anything. Okay. Now, uh, next was a question of celiac disease, celiac disease. So uh, some questions I'll tell you about celiac disease is that most sensitive or rather uh, one question is asked, not sensitive, but uh, let's go for what is the screening test of choice and what is the confirmatory test? Okay, confirmatory test. Now see, confirmatory test is actually the biopsy, okay? It is the biopsy, but if biopsy is not in the option or if the antibody is asked, then it would turn out to be IgA anti-endomycial. It has very high specificity. It has very high specificity and it is the most specific uh, investigation while screening test. The most sensitive test is IgA TTG, tissue transglutaminase, TTG. Okay. Now this TT, see uh, one thing in celiac disease, you need to understand that if the levels of IgA, see, uh, IgA deficiency can be seen in patients. So when you go for IgA TTG, first measure the total levels of IgA, then go for IgA TTG. If the IgA levels are decreased in patients who are IgA deficient, then the investigation will be IgG TTG. Okay. Not IgA TTG because IgA deficiency is there, so IgA will not be formed. So investigation of choice for patients who are IgA deficient uh, is uh, IgG TTG and not IgA TTG. Okay, so this is important in dermatitis hepatiformis is commonly seen with patients of uh, celiac disease. So uh, this was about it. Now, uh, next question was asked that uh, how to reduce the neural tube defects, neural tube defects. Decrease neural tube defects in the children. Okay, so they asked uh, that what what uh, which first they asked that whether will you give folate or will you give zinc. So we all know that it is folate, folic acid, folic acid which will decrease the prevalence or decrease the risk of a child suffering from a neural tube defect, and it is given one month before planning of conception. 
to three months after delivery. Okay, so this is the ideal thing. And for primary profile access and secondary profile access, like primary profile access, uh, the dose is 0.4 milligram. And for secondary profile access, it is four milligram. Now, obviously, there are some questions. I know uh, how the, the market, you only get five mg ka folic acid. So see, this is the guidelines. Practical ki baat nahi ho rahi hai. We are not talking about what we do in the practical life. Here, the guidelines say that if you want to prevent folic acid, uh, then you have, you have to, if you want to prevent neural tube defect, give 0.4. If you have had a child who had suffered from NTD, then now in the second pregnancy, you take 4 mg. Okay, so this is the dose that you uh, have to target for the patients who, uh, you know, to prevent neural tube defect. And these are the guidelines. Okay, so uh, the next question was that focal seizure is associated with. Focal seizure is associated with. So the three things that are associated with focal seizures are Jacksonian march, towards paralysis or paresis. It is uh, usually paresis, but it, it, it can also be paralysis. And epilepsy, partialis, continua. Okay. So this is a very important. Why this is important is that see what is jacksonian march you have had a seizure on the left side of your face but then it progresses to involve the left hand also so it is the jacksonian march and after the seizure has passed there is some degree of weakness in this limb that is towards paresis and it might continue for a longer period of time converting into status epilepticus which is known as epilepsia partialis continua. Okay, so uh, this was about it. Now next is uh, absent seizure. Those absent seizures, it was asked that they are characterized by. So there are two types. One is typical and second is atypical. So in typical, there is no loss of consciousness. There is no uh, hypotonia, no abnormal posture while in atypical there is loss of consciousness there might be loss of tone the child might fall off okay in typical it is three heard spike three heard spike and wave pattern spike wave pattern or it might be spike and dome pattern also while in atypical it is a less than three hertz so it is usually one to two hertz slow wave pattern and uh, the IQ is absolutely normal. IQ is absolutely normal in typical absent seizures, while uh, the atypical has decreased IQ. So these are the differences between the two types of uh, typical and atypical seizure and the drug of choice is ethosuximide. It's not valproate, it is ethosuximide, okay? So this is uh, important, uh, ethosuximide. And uh, it has a very fantastic response to anti-seizure medication. So that uh, you should know. Now, next question is that uh, what statement, what statement is false regarding scorpion sting? Okay. So first is that uh, scorpion stinger, sting uh, the poison or the venom. Venom is in the tail stinger okay obviously it is in the tail stinger or it does not uh, you know the, the the hands or the whatever it is called i don't know Usme nahi hota. it is just painful the the venom is in the tail of the uh, scorpion okay uh, next question was that most are painful but relatively harmless Okay. And third question was anticholinergic. Anticholinergic can be used if antivenom not available. Okay. So then how will we rule out all the options? So at the options were Okay, one and two are correct, two and three are correct, 
वन टू थ्री आर करेक्ट एंड वन एंड थ्री आर करेक्ट ओके सो फर्स्टली द वेनम इज इन टेल स्टिंगर दैट इज एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट स्टेटमेंट के भाई उधर से ही वेनम आता है नेक्स्ट इज मोस्ट आर पेनफुल बट रिलेटिवली हार्मलेस ओके दिस इज प्रोबेबली करेक्ट बट वी डू नॉट नो द स्टेट ऑफ द एग्जामिनर्स माइंड दिस इज करेक्ट बट वील सी दैट इफ इट टर्न आउट टू बी दैट वे ओके एंड द लास्ट क्वेश्चन वॉज एंटी द लास्ट क्वेश्चन एंटी कॉलिनर्जिक्स कैन बी यूज इफ एंटी वेनम नॉट अवेलेबल सी दिस इज अब्सोल्युटली रॉन्ग स्टेटमेंट यू कैनॉट गिव एंटी कॉलिनर्जिक्स इन पेशेंट विथ स्कॉर्पियन बाइड इट यू विल डिटोरियर द पेशेंट फर्दर ओके सी द ग्रेडिंग ऑफ स्कॉर्पियन बाइट द ग्रेडिंग ऑफ स्कॉर्पियन बाइट इज गिवन दैट ग्रेड वन ग्रेड वन हैज यूजली आइसोलेटेड पेन ग्रेड टू has usually hypotension hypotension sweating vomiting gi clinical features shivering okay uh, autonomic disturbance third is that there is shock in the patient cardiogenic shock is there there is pulmonary edema and there is altered consciousness now you will wonder that okay now then what what is pending for grade 4 so grade 3 and grade 4 are technically overlap okay they are nearly same but see what is the difference i'll tell you tachycardia with hypotension okay tachycardia with hypotension okay now this difference between 3 and 4 is that in patients of 3 there is excessive cholinergic involvement see what does the scorpion venom do it you know it activates both cholinergic and anti uh, and the uh, sympathetic system both systems are involved so initially the patient might come to you with early activation of cholinergic pathway so patient will be drooling patient will be in shock the patient will have bradycardia might have bradycardia patient will have altered consciousness so you will think that okay it is uh, the cholinergic pathway is activated more so you give atropine to the patient okay you give anticholinergic to the patient and then the the patient will go into the sympathetic phase because usually the patient actually in, in initial stage there is cholinergic involvement in the later stage or not the later stage like after 6 to 12 hours there is involvement of sympathetic system and at that point your atropine will kill the patient because you are stopping the cholinergic system and there is already sympathetic activation so you will kill the patient do not give atropine in any of the patient so this is very very important what can you treat with treatment of choice so for milder degrees you can give only nsaids because the pain is severe you can give only nsaids uh, you can give anti venom in india again anti venom is not available everywhere so other two things important are the prazosin and dobutamin now this prazosin and dobutamin why are they important you need to understand that prazosin will decrease the sympathetic activity sympathetic activity and it will calm down the heart and dobutamin will decrease pulmonary edema and it will give the cardiac a cardiac activity a much needed boost to you know pump the blood all over the body so that is important that uh, the three these are the three important drugs or and obviously anti venom is there but do not give anti cholinergics it is a wrong statement okay and the last question of today is that what are the components what are the components of cryo precipitates components of cryo precipitate okay now what are the components of cryo precipitate so components of cryo pre precipitates are factor 8 factor 13 and fibrinogen okay so these three things are there in the cryo precipitate uh, this you should just you know memorize ratta hi manna padega there is no option cryo precipitate has these three and it was asked that which factors are there so it was asked that fibrinogen factor 8 uh clotting factor 9 and von willebrand factor so depending upon that uh, you can uh, you know the von willebrand factor is also there so uh, all this you can just uh, you know understand that uh, what are the indications of cryo precipitate okay what are the indications the last thing first is congenital factor 8 or factor 13 deficiency okay so that is the first thing second is that uh, a fibrogenemia a fibrogenemia and von willebrand's disease 
one vilibrans disease you can also use desmopressin with what vilibrans disease mild one vilibrans disease okay and it is the most common see one vilibrans disease is the most common uh, uh, the disorder of the clotting pathway so uh, i guess that's all for today guys i hope you learned something new and we'll come out with part 2 and 3 uh, the questions that are mostly remaining are related to development and neonatology that's all we have tried to cover it that's all for today guys i hope you like this and if you like my effort please make sure you press the thumbs up and download the app please look at it uh, and tell me and follow me on my social media handles to get updated okay 